Thank you very much for the welcome and the opportunity to speak here. It's not really a context for levity, but since I do know that there was another Paul Weller in Sydney a few weeks ago at the Opera House, I should just clarify that he was the rock star and I'm the academic. Um, but who knows, maybe one day uh, sometimes rock stars and other people in public life uh, come out importantly to align themselves and support uh, issues and concerns in the world. Uh, Bono and other rock stars have done that, so maybe I should work um, on my co-named Paul Weller. It's a privilege for me to speak at this official opening, Reception of Advocates for Dignity. Um, I do so in three ways and three modes because um, that's who I am. I am an academic and I speak partially as an academic. I am also a person who tries to follow in the way of Jesus of Nazareth, peace be upon him. And I am also a human being. And I think all three of these things are part of the reason why I'm here speaking tonight and I hope might help connect with various of you in the audience in different ways. Advocates for Dignity is an organization that's being formed in order to try to draw attention to some of the terrible things that have been happening both in Turkey and beyond since the apparent coup attempt there. And in speaking at this opening, I should make it clear that I don't claim to be an academic expert on Turkey, although I have been a close observer of the country ever since my first visit to it well over a decade ago now. I also don't claim to be an expert on Islam as such. My expertise lies more broadly in religion, state and society uh, relationships, of which of course the theme tonight forms a part. But I do have some academic expertise accompanied by quite extensive personal experience of those predominantly but not exclusively Turkish Muslims involved in hizmet, meaning service, that is inspired by the teaching and life of the Turkish Muslim scholar Fethullah Gülen. And academics, of course, are sometimes famously known, sometimes criticized, for their having a, on the one hand this and on the other hand that approach to complex questions. And of course it's right that academics should approach things with skepticism of a proper kind and with a search for an evidence-based approach. Nevertheless, I believe it's important that on occasions at least, that academics, both as academics and if they are religious believers as I am, and if they wish to own their humanity, must also come out with an evaluation of particular situations and must be ready to take personal stands alongside, as far as one can, those who suffer from injustice in our world. And so that's why I'm here and that's why I'm speaking tonight. And I want to pay tribute to the naming of this particular initiative because I hope those who are behind it won't mind that I maybe let you in onto a little bit of a backstory because when I was first asked if I would speak at this event, um, the potential title for the organization was Victims of Turkey. And I'm sharing this change of name for a couple of very important reasons. First of all, the individuals and initiatives inspired by the teaching and example of Fethullah Gülen in my experience, and who identify with the movement religiously, do not act like a cult 
in which somebody makes a decision which is then transmitted to everybody else and then has to be implemented, as some have charged. Nor do they act like the command structure of a terrorist organization, the slander with which this network of pious individuals is charged, the so-called FETO, Fetullah Terrorist Organization. Rather, in both my general experience of Hizmet over many years and in the case of the debate around what one should call an initiative of this kind, it's far from those kinds of things. It's a place of lively debate. And so the name changed and the name is as it is tonight. And that substance of that name is also important. Why? Because it didn't have the passive word victims. It had the active word advocates. Advocates. And of course this is not to gloss over the very real victimization that thousands of people are experiencing. But it is that it is here tonight to found an initiative that's consistent with what is the positive ideals and teaching of Fethullah Gulen. And it's also focused on dignity. Why? Because again, in the teaching of Fethullah Gulen, what comes first is not that one is a Muslim, but that one is a human being. And then from humanity works out what it is to be a Muslim in the contemporary world, an engagement with the Quranic sources and all that makes for that. And so the focus here, not victims, but advocates, not focusing only on Muslimness or Hizmetness, but on dignity, human dignity. And also the title of Turkey wouldn't have been quite right, because although there are, as in all the societies of which we form a part, shared responsibilities for what occurs in our societies, it wouldn't be right to put at the doorstep of an entire country or people what is being perpetrated by a particular power structure and its active supporters. And also of Turkey wouldn't be quite right in geographical focus either, because people are also suffering outside of Turkey by virtue of their association with Hizmet. So this name is important and it tells you in itself and the process of arriving at it something very important about what's going on here and what lies behind it. It also universalizes the aim of the initiative. That's to say it's not selfish one, as it could be. And goodness only knows, I'm sure there are people sitting in this room with their own relatives, their own friends, who are suffering greatly at this time. And one could become consumed by that sense of suffering and focused only on that. But that this initiative, as was said to us in the opening speeches very clearly, yes, has a proper focus on the injustices occurring in Turkey and linked with Turkish developments, but it also seeks to connect with other injustices in other contexts. Why? Because at the heart of it all, is the concern with the human. So this is the context in which we meet. How did things come about as they came about? And I speak about a process that's going on, an attempt to strangulate, in a sense, this movement, this civil society network, both in Turkey and outside the country. And I think it's important to understand that this process did not begin just with the attempted coup or the events of that period. There was a process that began earlier than that. 
Uh, and it was a process that itself began with pressures upon Hizmet schools in Turkey itself and then beyond in a very difficult context inside of Turkey, a context where political leadership was seeking extension of power beyond constitutional terms by the changing of political seats. Similar process has happened, of course, in Russia in relation to Putin's move from being prime minister, limited in terms, to becoming president. And in that whole context, there was an attempt, because of the importance and the widespread respect for the Hizmet movement in Turkey, to try to gain an endorsement of that political positioning uh, from Fethullah Gulen and from the Hizmet movement. Now, of course, in many things in Turkish life, and in earlier periods, as Turkey came out of military rule, there had been important commonalities of interest, especially for believing Muslims, in emerging into public life in a way that had not always been possible under previous forms of governance. But this pressure and the background for it, I can't tell you too much more about it, or put it better than I would commend you to look at this publication, which you've got on your seats. And because, in particular, this is Australia, but also because I know that he's a scholar who knows what he's talking about in this field, I commend you to read from page 64 in here, uh, where Greg Barton from Deakin University has the title, What on Earth Has Gone So Wrong in Turkey? And there, for those of you who know little about it, there is solid and reliable information undergirded by scholarship of the highest quality. So I won't attempt to say more about that than what I have already done. But what we do know is when the events around the apparent coup took place, that the President Erdogan at that point very, very quickly pronounced this to be, quotes, a God-given opportunity. To do what? To follow through on things that he had previously begun to do and spoken about, and speaking so far as to use the word cleansing, now, my wife is German and comes from a society and a history where these things have a resonance that is frightening, cleansing of a group in society. And when you listen to some of the speeches and the inflammatory version of those speeches, it's spine-chilling to hear what is being said about human beings, even if, even if, there were any truth in the accusations of involvement in the coup, which are always been strongly denied by Fethullah Gulen and others. Because what's going on is a process of dehumanization, of dehumanization. And maybe the real coup, one could say, that took place was not what actually took place on the day that the so-called coup took place, but a few days later when the introduction of emergency rule took place, thereby suspending many of the protections, even within an imperfect legal system, which existed. And so, therefore, now allow the abuses, such as babies being imprisoned along with their mothers, in a way that Turkish law itself, in normal times, would not allow. And this state of emergency has become normalized as a dehumanizing thing, not only in relation to Hizmet, but also in relation to many other groups and people, journalists as a group of professionals, people from Kurdish background, Alevis and others, secularists who have nothing to do with Fethullah Gulen and are often entirely critical of him and of Hizmet, also caught up in 
the fallout from these events. Who to believe? Who to believe? The Turkish government charges. Fethullah Gülen denies. Well, again, I'd commend you to an article in this booklet on page 34 by Thomas Michel, entitled The Gülen Community, Who to Believe, Politicians or Actions. Politicians or Actions. Now, we've heard from Sophia's presentation of some, some of the actions undertaken by this network of people in some parts of the world. Who to believe? Is it possible to put together in a credible way the picture that is being promulgated of Fethullah Gülen and of this network of people with the actions that one experiences in different parts of the world? Is this credible to put them together? Or is there a major disjunction there? Of course, one can argue, and sometimes people do argue, that there's one face of Fethullah Gülen for the world, and there's another face, and there's one of the movement, and there's another face. But people who have experience, practical, concrete experience of the movement, do not buy that kind of approach. Why? Because as Saeed Nursi also taught, there are three main enemies for humankind. And it's these enemies, not people enemies, others who are enemies, but things that are in humanity that need to be overcome. And it's those things that Hizmet is dedicated to tackling. That is what? Ignorance? with education initiatives such as the schools network here in Australia but also in Iraq, in Nigeria. Poverty and the way that it saps the human spirit and shrivels human life and hope to be overcome with the giving of gift and the engagement in relief and development work and disunity and division to be addressed by the engagement in dialogue, taking seriously the other, allowing criticism from the other, being willing to give back to the other. These are the things, in my experience over many years, and in all that I've ever been able to discover through research, read about, reflect on, personally uncover, that this movement is concerned with. So you put this alongside Klein, and as Thomas Michel says, who does one believe? Now, I want in closing, towards closing, to finish also on a slight note of coming from within my own religious tradition, because I think it's not possible to understand this movement without understanding its religious roots and sources. Yes, it is a civil society movement, and sociologists who studied it can offer many things. But yes, it engages with the wider society, and for example, its schools are not religious schools in the sense that in many traditions one finds religious schools. They're inspired by people who have a religious vision, but they're for people of all backgrounds of religion and none. But to understand what this is about and where it comes from and how it might, in this desperate situation in which it finds itself, also find a way forward, one has to understand its religious inspiration. And so at this point I just want to share a short video clip because when I, as a Christian believer, had opportunity in November to meet with Fethullah Gulen, I felt it appropriate to recite to him something from the words of Jesus in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. And as I did so, the call to prayer, the Muslim call to prayer, came in the background. It's just a few seconds of a clip. Amen. 
see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To understand this movement, one must understand it religiously. Not in the narrow sense of religion, but in the sense of the spirit of religion, which is precisely that which Fethullah Gulen advocates, and why he says, for example, Islam does not need the state to survive. This is a radical, unusual message within the Muslim world. Not the thing one would expect to hear from a person masterminding a coup from Pennsylvania into Turkey. This is a radical understanding of how to be present as a faithful Muslim in the world, contributing to it and transforming it. Fethullah Gulen himself, and you can go and have a look um, on the website if you click in Living Abroad plus Gulen, you will find on the 21st of February his reflections on living abroad, migration, martyrdom and service. And I commend you to have a look at that because the sense of humanity that you will gain through that, yes, there are these figures and numbers here, important. But when you read what he has to say about the feelings that accompany this, the homesickness, a home, a place they are used to, their street, a place they are used to, relatives and neighbours they sat and talked with, parents, relatives, children, forced apart, forced to be away, travelling to the hereafter, because that's the frame of reference, that's the belief, while thinking of all of this though is hard. It's not a kind of cheap religious belief. It takes seriously this pain and suffering along the way. And Fethullah Gulen in this website and his message goes on to reflect on what has happened when some people have sought help, as those who become exiles have done. And he said this, when they saw the deprivation and suffering, some took out their house keys from their pockets and handed them over. If there were no keys to give, they would say, rent a place somewhere and we will pay the rent. Germany, he said, moved to offer support in this way, as did Canada, partly France, the United States and other places. As for the Islamic world, and here is a critique from a profoundly Muslim scholar, the majority, they just slept. How shameful it is to sleep next to the one who acts. One moves to offer support. There may not be things that are required in your set of beliefs, but there are the attributes of a believer. God does not look at your appearance or your identity, whether you say, Allah, I am Turkish, I am Kurdish, I am Albanian, I am Bosnian, I am Georgian or any other ethnicity. He looks at your heart, the sense of humanity, and the belief that resides therein. So, dear friends, in this room tonight, and also any broadcast of this event that goes wider, I think the challenge for us is clear, especially for those of us who are not part of Hizmet in a direct sense. There are so many good people in Hizmet doing so many good things who did their first migration going to lands and countries they had no conception of and founding schools, doing good works and many of them are now facing a second migration that is forced. These people, these friends, do not wish, really, to spend their time and energy advocating for themselves. They wish to continue 
with doing what they have been doing in many of our societies over the years. Tackling that ignorance, tackling that poverty, tackling that division with education, with relief and with dialogue. So this means that for the rest of us, there is an even greater responsibility for us to stand up and to be counted, and in the words of this initiative, to be advocates for dignity. Thank you.